I hope you'll take the opportunity to read uh, the biographical information on Dr. Noggle. I will give only a shortened version of that in the interest of time. John Noggle is a retired Lieutenant Colonel of the United States Army, a graduate of West Point and a Rhodes Scholar. He received his PhD from St. Anthony's College in Oxford, where he wrote his thesis on counterinsurgency in Malaya and Vietnam. Noggle served as the military assistant to Deputy Secretaries of Defense Paul Wolfowitz and Gordon England, where he co-authored the U.S. Army and Marine Corps Counterinsurgency Field Manual with Generals David Petraeus and James M. Mattis. He's the former president of the Center for a New American Society and currently the ninth headmaster of the Haverford School in Pennsylvania. It's always a pleasure pleasure and a privilege to have with us Dr. John A. Noggle. Thanks, Richard, for that kind introduction. Thanks, Fred, for that prayer. Thanks, Fred, for being my workout partner this morning. Uh, a healthy mind and a healthy body is an important part of, uh, of I think, a life well lived. Uh, thanks to all of you for being here today. I'm going to wander aimlessly. Uh, which will make it hard for the camera person back there. Sorry about that camera person. Uh, it'll be all right. And I'm camouflaged now, so I'll be harder to track as well. So um, my, my military service began a long, long time ago before, uh, b before the young cadets were born. At about the time the senior cadets were being born, I got to have uh, lunch with some of the, the more senior cadets today. Uh, and they were busy being born uh, just as the, the Soviet Union was collapsing. So I'm a, a, a year group 1988 officer. Um, commissioned in, in 88 out of West Point, uh, product of the Cold War, grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, the, the headquarters of Strategic Air Command. The Cold War was very real to me in my uh, elementary school. We did duck and cover drills as if that would have made any difference if the Soviet Union had attacked the headquarters of America's uh, nuclear arsenal. And, and, and so the, 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 the quick uh, coincidence of the end of the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989, uh, and then the, um, as, as peace was breaking out all over, Saddam Hussein demonstrating that perhaps it wasn't, uh, Saddam Hussein deciding that, that uh, Iraq wasn't quite big enough and needed a 19th province, uh, the, the province of Kuwait, in, uh, uh, in the summer of 1990, all, all happened as, as a, a, a student of international relations uh, that I was. Uh, a graduate of, of West Point and of Oxford, was, was finally putting all of that education to use. And, and as I um, sit here in this, stand here, wander here, in, in this, this uh, great institution of higher learning, um, you're being educated and trained for this purpose, for when your nation calls that you are ready and capable and the nation can count on you to do what needs doing and some things needed doing in the summer of 1990. And so I was assigned to the 1st Cavalry Division out of Fort Hood, Texas, the famous first team, and, and uh, received command of a tank platoon actually in the sand in the desert. And, and uh, uh, my predecessor was a young man um, who, who, for whatever reason, despite the training and the education he had received, um, when, when the nation called, he wasn't ready. And he asked to step down from leadership of his tank platoon. And, and I was, was allowed to step in and, and met my platoon on a, a, beautiful, um, a beautiful afternoon in October of 1990. The sun was going down behind the tank. You, 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 you couldn't script this in a movie. Nobody would believe it. Uh, the, the, the 15 soldiers uh, lying against the tank, sitting on the tank, hanging out around the tank to meet this new platoon leader who was going to lead them into war. In, in every case, those 15 men to war for the first time. And so I stood in front of them and I introduced myself with all the bravado I could muster, pretending I wasn't terrified, pretending I had some idea what I was doing. And I said, at, at the end, I said, any questions? And one of them said, yes, sir, I've got a question. Did you, they tell you we were the worst platoon in the battalion or in the whole brigade? And I answered truthfully, and I said, they said it was the worst platoon in the brigade. And that just changed. 
And, and so we, we started training, and we were fortunate to have several months before the bullets started flying for real. And, and ultimately, I got to be a part of Operation Desert Storm, the thunder and the lightning of Desert Storm, the first cavalry, and, and was part of an operation. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, um, cognizant of the fact that we have the, the America's best, which means the world's best ROTC, Air Force ROTC detachment in the room. So, so let me give credit where it's due. Uh, to an enemy that had been really, really softened up and pretty much decimated by the U.S. Air Force. Uh, but but uh, the ground war, 100 hours. We took the Iraqi army in 100 hours from the fourth largest army in the world to the second largest army in Iraq, right? And that was, that was a, pretty, uh, a, a, a pretty uplifting experience for a young, uh, a young man who turned 25 on the day the war ended. And, and cadets in the room, let me give you a quick piece of advice that I hope you will remember. This may be the only thing you remember from my whole talk. Never let your platoon know it's your birthday. <laughs> Bad things happen. Uh, fortunately, we were wearing charcoal chemical suits, and so uh, the, the birthday spanking I received didn't hurt as much as it would otherwise. But we were young, and we were alive, uh, and our first war had come to a close. And, and then came, uh, in a lot of ways, the important part of the experience, right? So, so William Wordsworth said, a, a poetry is powerful emotion recollected in tranquility. And so now I had the chance to reflect on what I'd learned and what I'd seen in quick succession. The end of the Cold War, the invasion of, of Kuwait by Iraq, and then uh, the, the destruction of the Iraqi army, the very rapid defeat of, of one of the world's most powerful militaries. And, and I, I, I'm a student of warfare. I'd, I'd been trained at, at West Point and Oxford to think about warfare, to think about the future, to think about the trends that drive history, right? There's big, big sweeping trends that drive history. And, and I became convinced as I thought about what I'd seen, the, the combination of those events, that in, in Desert Storm, the United States had demonstrated that it was the very best force in the world at conventional force-on-force -force conflict. And therefore, because we were so good, because our army, and in particular, because our Air Force were so good, nobody would ever fight us that way again. So a big part of this talk is going to be the fact that the enemy gets a vote. And no enemy in their right mind would let the US Air Force and the US Army blow them up, array themselves a neat battle array, and allow us to destroy them as the Iraqi army had. Instead, I became convinced the future of conflict was going to look much more like our nation's previous war in Vietnam, a war that hadn't gone very well for us, than it would look like a repeat of Desert Storm, a war that had gone very, very well for us. And, and um, as, as I thought about this, my nation, sadly, was taking a different lesson, right? So, so President George H.W. Bush, in my eyes, the best president of our lifetime, uh, made the incorrect statement, by God, we've licked the Vietnam syndrome once and for all in the wake of Operation Desert Storm. Uh, some guys at the Pentagon put up a sign uh, on that great building that said, we only do deserts. <laughs> but, but I was convinced, it's all true, by the way. I was convinced, I can take this off. Now. I was, I mess up my hair. You're allowed to have hair when you get out, it's great. Um, if, if it sticks around that long, right? I mean. <laughs> There's some lessons there, guys. There's some lessons there. So, so um, when, when the Army decided to send me, after Desert Storm, back to Oxford to get my PhD, because we all make sacrifices for national security, <laughs> work with me, guys, work with me, I, I decided to look not at the kind of war I just fought, right, but at the kind of war that I thought we were going to fight in the future, at, at wars of insurgency and guerrilla warfare and terrorism. And, and so if that happens, if you're at Oxford uh, studying uh, counterinsurgency and counterterrorism, you have to read the works of T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, right? A, a famous guerrilla leader. He, he was an insurgent. He led a, a band of Arab guerrillas against a conventional Western army during the First World War. And Lawrence actually felt sorry for the conventional armies that had to fight his Arab guerrillas. He said, for them, we're like a vapor. We rise up out of the sand, we congeal, we strike, and we dissolve back into the sand. They're left with nothing to swing at, nothing to hit. They're like a blind boxer. They could kill us if they could only find us. 
For them, war on rebellion was messy and slow, like eating soup with a knife. And I happened to read that phrase in Lawrence's Seven Pillars of Wisdom in the tub. I'd been for a run. Running is something the Army does, Air Force. And, and I'd, I'd, I'd been for a run on Oxford's Fort Meadow. <laughs> I'll hear about this later. Uh, and, and, and was in the bathtub, uh, drinking champagne, eating strawberries, because it's Oxford. That's what you do there, right? And, and, and I read that phrase, and, and I came out of the tub and, and said, Eureka, I have found it. I have the title of my dissertation, Learning to Eat Soup with a Knife. So seven words down, 99,993 to go. Remember that, cadets, the next time you're complaining about a 10-page research paper, right? 99,993 to go. And to fill those 99,993 words, I decided to compare the cases of two counterinsurgency campaigns, the case of the British Army in Malaya, as Richard just said, and the American Army in Vietnam. So the Brits fought a counterinsurgency campaign in Malaya, what we today call Malaysia, from 1948 to 1960. And they started badly. Conventional armies tend to start badly when they're fighting insurgents because it's not what they're designed to do. They're designed to fight other armies that look like them. Right? But the Brits adapted, they learned, and they ultimately defeated their insurgent enemies in what is today widely viewed to be the classic case of successful Western counterinsurgency in the 20th century. And it only took them 12 years. So when Lawrence said messy and slow, he wasn't kidding. I compared that case with the American Army in Vietnam, which also started badly when fighting an insurgency, as we would expect, which also adapted and learned, as we would hope. But it didn't learn fast enough. When a great power loses a small war, it does so for one reason and one reason only. It's not going to run out of tanks. It's not going to run out of fighter planes. It's not going to run out of soldiers. It's going to run out of will, resolve, national will. Right? And, and that's what happened in Vietnam with excruciatingly bad results for the people of South Vietnam, who suffered horribly. Right? For the entire region, the Khmer Rouge came to power in Cambodia, I would argue is a direct result of our failings in Vietnam. The killing fields is, is horrifying, and, 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 and you must see it. And you, to understand what the failings of American foreign policy mean for the people of the world, they, it matters whether we get this stuff right, and with hugely bad implications and, and, and long-term consequences for the American military, and in particular for the American Army, which took a full generation to recover from the trauma of losing the Vietnam War. And so I argued, as I was concluding my dissertation, that, that the ability to adapt and learn, and in particular the ability to adapt and learn how to conduct insurgencies, fight insurgencies, conduct counterinsurgency campaigns, was an important attribute for US military forces to have. And I completed that work in 1997, and I am, am proud to say that it was the best and ashamed to say that it was the worst doctoral dissertation written on counterinsurgency in the 1990s, because it was the only doctoral dissertation written on counterinsurgency in the 1990s. And so when I sent it off to university presses, good university presses, which I won't embarrass by mentioning here, <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, I received back rejection letters asking me why I was writing about a subject that nobody cared about and why I didn't study something that had some contemporary relevance. A few years later, after the attacks of September 11th had reminded us that insurgency and terrorism are a much more ancient form of war than so-called conventional force-on-force -force conflict, uh, suddenly I was able to get the thing published and, 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 um, and publish the, the um, what did Newt Gingrich say? Um, um, so so uh, Newt was talking about my books on Fox News and, and said, uh, John Noggle has written the best recent book on counter, the, the best book written by an American on counterinsurgency in modern times, which was undeniably true because it was the only book on counterinsurgency written by an American uh, at the time he said it. it, it, it there, there have been a whole bunch more, many of them much better since then. And, and so I, I did, was finally able to get the book published after September 11th. And, and then having written the book, I went and did the research. 
and, and in general, uh, cadets and students, I would encourage you to do it in the opposite direction, to do the research first. But having written a book on counterinsurgency, I went off to practice counterinsurgency for the first time in fall of 2003. Uh, we had invaded Iraq unnecessarily. I want to get that, get that out right at the start. A, a mistake, the invasion of Iraq, a mistake, an unnecessary decision, a very poor decision. We had invaded it not only unnecessarily, but also very, very badly with no plan for the aftermath, particularly inexcusable given that, that the invasion of Iraq in 2003 was, in Richard Haas's words, uh, a, a war of choice, not a war of necessity. And, and so in the fall of 2003, my tank battalion task force was sent to El Anbar province of Iraq as Iraq was descending very, very rapidly into civil war. Um, we, were, we were stationed in a town named Chaldea, a lovely little town uh, in between the also lovely, slightly larger towns of Ramadi, the provincial capital of Al Anbar, and Fallujah, uh, a pretty tough little town that became much in the news in the years that followed. And, and so that gives you a sense of the neighborhood I was in, pretty good neighborhood. Uh, actually bought some property there. We were going to retire there, but, but the, the, the schools are better in Philadelphia, so that's where we ended up, <laughs> right? Tough, tough, tough town, tough, tough fight uh, over the course of the, the year that followed. Uh, my task force of 800 lost 23 soldiers, uh, had more than 150 wounded, uh, earned the Valorous Unit Award, and at the end of our year of fighting, we were no closer to succeeding, to achieving American objectives in Iraq than we had been when we started. In many ways, we were further behind. And so the, the smart aleck battle captain uh, in my three shop printed up coffee mugs when we got back to Fort Riley that said Iraq 2003-2004, we were winning when I left, right? And we weren't, and we knew it. And I went from Al Anbar almost directly to the E-ring of the Pentagon, to the Office of Deputy Secretary of Defense, Paul Wolfowitz, the number two person, the chief operating officer of the world's largest organization, the US military. And the Pentagon was a big change from Al Anbar, wait for it, at least in Iraq, I'd had some idea who I was fighting against. <laughs> right. and, and, uh, and we talked at lunch about the importance of serving in the Pentagon uh, for, for the, the military officers, the future officers in the room, as early as you can to understand how it works. And I've got to tell you, when you've been fighting for a year and losing friends, uh, you really hope that somebody somewhere has a plan. It doesn't make sense to you on the ground, but you really hope somebody up there somewhere knows what they're doing. And it is extraordinarily discouraging to realize, not so much. And, and so I spent, um, I, I spent uh, two, two pretty difficult years in, in the Pentagon trying to help us figure out the war that we were then losing and, and losing pretty badly. I had a, a um, um, and, and a, the, there's a guy named Fred Kaplan, uh, interesting thinker and writer, PhD from MIT. Uh, his, his, uh, First book, still probably his best book, was The Wizards of Armageddon about the nuclear strategists. Uh, his most recent book is, is called The Insurgents, uh, uh, David Petraeus and the Plot to Change the American Way of War. And I'm going to talk about the, the, the um, subject he describes, the, the plot, so-called plot, uh, or, or in the next couple of minutes. Uh, um, I, I've told him that he should really call that book The Wizards of Less Than Armageddon, right? The Wizards of Counterinsurgency. And, and he, in, in the book, he, he describes me at this point wandering the halls of the Pentagon with a gaunt, haggard look on my face, desperately looking for someone to talk to about counterinsurgency. And that's probably about right. Um, my, my big ally in that fight was a guy named David Petraeus. Uh, Captain David Petraeus had been one of my teachers at West Point. And uh, I, he was a pretty special guy even then. I, I was pretty sure he was going to be somebody. I thought he was going to make 06 for sure. Right? He was, <laughs> was going to be a big guy. Um, Turns out he did a little better than that, right? And uh, um, the awesome power of a Fulberg colonel, particularly in the Pentagon, right? You're, <laughs> you're allowed to hand the coffee to the Brigadier General to give to somebody important. Um, that's true. That's true. That's true, right? Uh, so so uh, uh, Petraeus was, was doing a little better than that. Uh, I'd stayed in touch with him. And there's a lesson there. Stay in touch with your mentors, right? They will help you. Uh, they, they may. They may give you really tough tasks, as you'll hear in a minute, but they will help you. And, and so maintaining a relationship with Petraeus was enormously important to me. 
uh, Petraeus back from his second tour in Iraq, and I got the chance to, to pull him aside on one of his visits to the Deputy Secretary of Defense, to Paul Wolfowitz, and say, General, we need to write a new instruction book for how to conduct counterinsurgency. We haven't done it since Vietnam. We don't know how to do it. We haven't been trained on it. We need to do it better. And Petraeus said, John, that's a great idea. Why don't you get to work on that? And so I did. Uh, and, and we pulled together a team of people, and, and, and three people with an idea can change the world. Three people with an idea committed to that idea can change the world. It's, it's a minimum of three. Um, our, our team ended up being uh, bigger than that, but not appreciably bigger than that. And, and uh, over the course of a year, from uh, 13 months from November of 2005 to December of 2006, we wrote the U.S. Army Marine Corps Counterinsurgency Field Manual and uh, um, published that book on December 15, 2006. It was downloaded a million and a half times in the next month. It was translated and critiqued on jihadi websites. Copies were found in Taliban training camps in Pakistan. So we knew our enemies were reading it. We just had to get our guys to do that, <laughs> right? It's easy to get cadets and young officers and sergeants to read stuff, right? I mean, you, yeah, easy. Right? You guys are all over it, right? Uh, and, and so the, the process of doing that, of, of um, turning counterinsurgency into a, a topic uh, both that the military understood, but, but just as importantly that the American people understood because the limiting factor on our fight in Iraq and Afghanistan was national will, was the support of the American people for the fight. And so we had multiple audiences to talk to, we were enormously fortunate that the University of Chicago Press agreed to print the counterinsurgency field manual and issue it as a book, and enormously fortunate that the New York Times chose to review it on the front page of its Sunday book review section, first time that had happened, and that, that the Daily Show with John Stewart invited me to come on board and sit down with John to talk about the U.S. Army Marine Corps counterinsurgency field manual where the two of us had the funniest discussion John Stewart has ever had about an Army field manual on camera. <laughs> and you think that's because it's the only one, but it's not. He tried it again later with somebody else and it didn't go so well. But so, and, and you can look it up, uh, the, the miracle of YouTube. Uh, but, but so uh, there was, there was um, Fred Kaplan talked about a plot and there was in fact a plot. And, and we were working hard to give Petraeus the time he needed to implement counterinsurgency strategy in Iraq, even as American support for the war diminished dramatically. And it was a near run thing, right? So in, in uh, November of 2006, in the midterm elections of 2006, the, the um, American people were very uh, disappointed with the leadership of, of this country, and rightly so in my eyes. Uh, they turned out uh, uh, the Republican majority in both the House and the Senate if we had a parliamentary system of government like every other civilized country in the world, the government would have fallen and we would have had a new prime minister because we have the very unusual presidential system. George Bush had one more try. Right? And uh, although he was facing democratic majorities in both houses, which made it more difficult for him, and he made the bravest and in my eyes the best decisions of his presidency, replacing Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld, the worst Secretary of Defense we've ever had with Bob Gates, the best Secretary of Defense we've ever had, uh, and uh, putting a new commander in charge in Iraq, Dave Petraeus. And, and Petraeus implemented the principles of the counterinsurgency manual, uh, which are, are essentially two. First, uh, the, 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 the hard part of conventional combat isn't, isn't finding your enemy. He's in the tanks that don't look like yours. It's not that hard. Right? Uh, the hard part is killing him. Right? In irregular warfare, uh, it's pretty easy to kill them or capture them the hard part is figuring out who they are. Right? The insurgents are, to use Mao's phrase, fish swimming among the sea of the people. Right? And, and so the essence of counterinsurgency, the manual said, is to protect the population first, protect the population so that they feel safe telling you who the insurgents are. Right? So precept one, protect the population. Precept two, learn and adapt because it is hard for armies to change from this to this. And so you have to build adaptive, flexible learning institutions. And, and that's an effort that the U.S. military is still engaged in, in understanding 
that um, answers are not prescribed, answers for every situation are not prescribed, that you need to understand the culture in which you're operating, the language of the people you're working with, their political ambitions, their fears, their desires, in order to protect them, in order to keep them safe, in order to build a better future for them and to get them on board in that effort, a very different kind of war than my first kind of war, far more complicated. And so the counterinsurgency manual begins with a quote from a special forces off friend of mine, officer, uh, who, who when he learned that I was helping write the counterinsurgency manual and said, remember John, uh, counterinsurgency is the graduate level of war because you have to do all of this stuff but you also have to do the politics and the economics and the tribal society and the cultural anthropology and you have to do it in a language you don't speak. And you have to build relationships with people you can't necessarily trust. And that's really, really hard. And, and the good news for our country is that a bunch of you in this room have been engaged in, in efforts in some ways similar to that, one of the great advantages, uh, one of the great national assets we have. Young people who have lived abroad, who speak foreign languages more broadly, one of the great strengths of this nation. Um, as, as Bill Murray says in, in the classic Army training film, Stripes, right? <laughs> we're Americans. Our ancestors were kicked out of every decent country in the world. Right, and, 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 and both, both, both um, those people right, who, who, who had the courage to, to flee their home countries and, and work to, to the courage to, to, to take risks and, and try to develop a, a brighter future, uh, but, but also um, um, the, the, the language skills and the cultural knowledge that they draw upon are, are, are some of the things that, that, that make this country, I believe, the best bet the world has for the long term, the, the, the great advantage. Uh, we have. And, and so Petraeus put those precepts to work. Uh, Napoleon, uh, Napoleon said, uh, uh, all my generals are good. Give me some who are lucky. Petraeus, I would argue, was well, both lucky and good. Uh, he took advantage of something called the Sawa or the Awakening. So we were fighting two different groups who would, had been allied uh, in Iraq and in particular in Al-Anbar. We were fighting the Sunnis who were upset that they had been dispossessed. Uh, the, a minority of the Iraqi population, they had had a majority of the political power when we toppled the Iraqi government uh, and, and imposed some form of democracy. Uh, the Sunnis dispossessed of power, didn't like it, fought against it, fought against the, the, the Shia government that replaced them, and fought against uh, us. We were also fighting Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And, and Al-Qaeda had had no presence in Iraq prior to our invasion in March of 2003. Saddam wouldn't have tolerated that. He ruled that country for better and for worse with a pretty tight hand. Uh, but, but in the chaos that followed, our toppling of him, our failure to, to create a plan to secure the peace. Uh, St. Augustine, the only purpose of a war is to build a better peace. We failed to plan for that better peace. Uh, uh, Al-Qaeda moved in, and, and Al-Qaeda in Iraq became a big part of the enemy we faced. The good news about Al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, is, is also the good news about their successor organization, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. ISIS is a direct descendant of AQI. These people are so brutal that nobody wants to live under their rule. And the Sunni tribes of Al-Anbar chafed under their rule and ultimately decided to switch sides and fight with us against them in, in an uprising and awakening called the Sawa in Arabic. And, and um, as a result of the Sawa, as a result of the counterinsurgency principles uh, that Petraeus implemented as a result of some good luck, um, he was able during his 18 months in command to reduce violence in Iraq by some three quarters and, and provide a reasonable chance for Iraq to endure as a, a reasonably democratic state in the Middle East, which is a pretty rare thing, uh, and, and one that, that had a foreign policy that was broadly speaking aligned with the interests of the United States in the region. Unfortunately, that, that opportunity was squandered by the subsequent administration, by the Obama administration, which against the advice of everyone uh, myself included, but many people a whole lot smarter than me, including the aforementioned Petraeus, uh, Hillary Clinton, his secretary, his uh, secretary of state, Bob Gates, his secretary of defense, Leon Panetta, his uh, uh, director of central intelligence, um, all recommended that the president maintain a long-term U.S. security presence in Iraq of some 15 or 20,000. He chose not to do so. That decision not to station a long-term security presence in Iraq um, uh, gave room for, provided the opportunity for the Islamic State to retake the ground 
that my men, that my soldiers died uh, fighting to take uh, in the first place, to, died fighting to take from Al-Qaeda in Iraq and from the Sunni insurgency. And, and um, I, I won't talk about Afghanistan now. If anybody wants to talk about Afghanistan in questions, I'm happy to. Uh, it is uh, uh, beyond belief to me that we plan to make the same mistake in Afghanistan uh, after uh, many years of, of effort there and after, uh, despite the extraordinary importance of Afghanistan as a long-term base uh, for American special operation forces, for American intelligence assets, to keep an eye on Pakistan, the most dangerous country in the world for U.S. interests, Pakistan, our great and noble friends and allies, the Pakistanis, right? Scare me silly, right? Uh, we, need, we need to keep an eye on them, and Afghanistan is a great place from which to do that. Uh, so despite despite uh, the lessons of Iraq and the importance of Afghanistan as a long-term base uh, in support of American interest in that region, uh, we currently plan to withdraw all American troops from Afghanistan uh, by, by uh, December of 2016, uh, completely arbitrary date uh, geopolitically, uh, an important date politically uh, for one man's legacy, uh, and a decision that I still hope will be overturned. Uh, briefly, um, the, the kind of wars I've been talking about today uh, in, in Iraq, in Iraq again now, the third Iraq war of my lifetime currently uh, happening against the Islamic State, uh, the continuing war in, in uh, Afghanistan against the Taliban, the broader war uh, against Al-Qaeda and its successor organizations against radical Islamic extremism, uh, a, a already a 20 plus year war, a uh, war that for America began in 1993 with the first bombing of the World Trade Center a bomb that almost succeeded uh, in bringing down the towers, and of course, uh, eight years later, their second attempt would in fact succeed. We're 20 years into this war. Uh, I predict that uh, um, very few of you in this uh, auditorium will live long enough to see the end of this war against radical Islamic extremism. This is a multi-generational fight. We can make choices that will make that, that end come sooner, or we can make choices that will uh, make that war last longer. Um, we have not made particularly good choices, as I've indicated, uh, over the past several years. And, and the worst decision we made was the decision to invade Iraq in 2003, which absolutely provided fire uh, to, to tinder, um, poured gasoline on, on Islamic extremism, gave them a cause celeb for which to fight. And, and we will be paying the price uh, for that mistake, both financially uh, and, and uh, in lives and in the security of the American people and our friends around the globe for generations. Um, so that's, that's the bad news. Uh, the good news, uh, if, if I may, uh, and there is a whole lot, is uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm a headmaster now, if I'm, I'm in education. Uh, you can't be an educator, and uh, you certainly can't be a good educator and not be optimistic about the future, and, and education is an investment in the future. And, and I've been privileged for the past several months to be uh, wandering around speaking on, on some great college campuses in the last uh, few weeks. I've been at West Point and the Naval Academy and Duke and UVA um, at Berkeley next week and, and here uh, this week obviously I'm here at BYU. Uh, and I've also gotten the chance to speak to some of our military forces, uh, active duty military forces, including the 101st Airborne at Fort Campbell, Kentucky a few weeks ago. And, and it, the, the young people of this country are enthusiastic and committed and dedicated to making a difference. And in particular, because I know them best, uh, our, our military are um, unbelievably um, patriotic and committed and willing to, to assume unlimited liability in support of a government uh, despite the fact that that government over the last 15 years has not made particularly good decisions and has put many <coughs> of them unnecessarily at risk. And so my hope is uh, that, that we are able to elect governments as a people, as a democratic people, uh, that are worthy of uh, our, our, our military in uniform and that build uh, a country and a future uh, that, um, that all of you are, are going to bring to fruition. So I'm delighted to be here. I look forward to your questions. Let me just mention, as the, before the first question, that uh, Dr. Noggle has uh, is, will be signing copies of his book, Knife Fights, 
in the, uh, inside the special collections room as you exit the hallway. Just go to your left. There's a room inside there. He will be there and uh, be, it, it, uh, we'll, uh, we'll conduct a book signing for however long it takes. So we just wanted you to know that. Questions? You can just use that mic. Um, so I know you mentioned we, we won't get into Afghanistan much, but apparently we're going to. Though. <laughs> we are. Uh, towards the end of Afghanistan, there was an increase in village stability operations (VSOs), and I want to know what you th if you think that those village stability operations worked, and whether there's an opportunity for that in these current conflicts and future conflicts. So, uh, did, were you involved in VSOs? Or <laughs> no, you, no? no, no, no. Some of my family members were. Great, fantastic. So w w there been uh, we've had to relearn how to conduct counterinsurgency a after actually getting reasonably good at it by the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, village stability operations are, are not dissimilar to uh, some innovations that were conducted in particular by the Marines in Vietnam, something called combined action platoons. Um, uh, we, we've, we've done some good things with the State Department and, and uh, had some great uh, State Department officers who've worked hard to stabilize uh, towns and villages and uh, uh, Carter Malkasian uh, my good friend um, had won, won the silver medal at the Council on Foreign Relations in December for his book, War Comes to Garmsir, which is one of the best books uh, on Afghanistan. I think one of, one of just two uh, great books, truly great books on Afghanistan, War Comes to Garmsir, uh, uh, echoing the, the, the title of a great book on Vietnam, War Comes to Long On. And, and um, I, I mentioned the counterinsurgency field manual and, and uh, its recognition that we needed to learn and adapt. Uh, it, the counterinsurgency manual, I'm pleased and proud to say, has an annotated bibliography uh, at, at, at the end of it. To my knowledge, the first time an Army field manual has ever in the Army's history had an annotated bibliography, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and my own book, Night Fights, also has a, a bibliography at the back. So, so the more we can do to integrate state and the U.S. Agency for International Development and the U.S. military and our intelligence agencies together in operations like VSOs, village stability operations, the more effective we're going to be. Sadly, we've done a really lousy job at funding state and AID, um, and, and although we've traditionally done a really good job of funding the military, even that is suffering under sequester, a, a, a horrible abdication of its responsibility by the U.S. Congress, both houses. And, and so uh, we have not built as much capability in state and USAID as we need to do those as effectively or over, over as broad a scale as I'm afraid we're going to have to do because um, these the, in, insurgency is not going to go away and I think is likely to only uh, continue. So we're, we're facing a number of pressures um, that, that in particular are going to hit the least capable governments in the world. Uh, population growth, resource depletion, climate change. When, when, when Philly has had more snow than, than Provo has, right, it's getting harder and harder to deny climate change, right? The, the, but the, right, Bangladesh is going to be underwater, and, and so we're going to need village stability capabilities more and more and more in years to come. We have not done a great job of building them, but I love them. Thank you, Thank you for your question. Sir. So you mentioned a couple minutes ago that we can either choose to, like, there's choices we can make for the, the war on, on terror as just a catch-all. We could end that sooner or we could end it later. Um, but listening to things, some of the things you've said uh, before, it doesn't necessarily sound like ending it sooner would be the, the better option. So could you go more into, like, mm -hmm. what, uh, what you think about that and um, what kind of our long-term solution should be? Great. So, so I was asked a, a, a really smart question at, uh, at lunch by one of the, the more senior cadets who, who, who asked, you know, how do you get at the root causes of terrorism? And, and um, ultimately what we're, what, we're, what we're fighting is, there's a very good New York Times, uh, front page New York Times piece on this today uh, about the Obama administration's unwillingness to, to, call, it, to call it what it is, to, to admit that we are fighting radical Islamic extremism. We are not fighting a war on terror terror is a tactic. We are fighting a war against radical Islamic extremists who want to recreate the caliphate, the, the seventh century uh, 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 expanse of, of uh, the Islamic world governed by radical Sharia law. And, and uh, the Atlantic Monthly has a good piece on, on the goals of the Islamic State. And they're, they're pretty clear, actually, about what they're trying to accomplish. And they've been very clear 
about what, what they're willing to do to accomplish them, right? So, so we know who we're fighting. We know what they want to do. We also have some pretty good ideas on what we need to do to defeat them. So we need to encourage political reform. One of the big things that changed in Iraq under, under Petraeus's tenure and after was that the Shia-dominated government became more inclusive of Sunnis, invited them into the government, provided them, frankly, bought them off in a lot of cases. It works. Uh, and it's a whole lot cheaper uh, than paying for funerals, right? Um, um, we need to do a much better job of combating the ideology of, of the Islamic State in particular, but of radical Islamic extremism uh, more broadly. Uh, there was good news on this um, uh, over the course of this week um, as the, the, the State Department is going to step up its work on the internets. The, the one of the most disturbing, as, as you think about the Islamic State, you should know uh, first that it is the largest geographically, um, uh, it is the lar largest terror group in history. It holds more territory than any terror group has in the history of man, uh, territory roughly the size of, of the state of Maryland across, um, both, uh, across parts of Iraq and parts of Syria. Um, it, it has attracted literally thousands of Western passport holders to fight with it. And those folks are going to be the gift that keeps on giving for generations to come. They've been radicalized, they've been trained. So Osama bin Laden was trained by us Right, during the war against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, supported by the CIA, and, and we, we failed to, to stick the landing and build a better peace in Afghanistan afterwards, and, and are, are still paying the price for that. Um, there's, there's literally thousands of Western passport holders who have been radicalized by and trained by the Islamic State. We're gonna, we're, that's really bad. Um, in some ways, even more worrying uh, they, are rad they are using the internet to radicalize people who have never traveled to Iraq or Syria, right? And, and we, we've seen this um, in Paris. Um, we've seen it, I haven't tracked the Copenhagen case uh, as closely, but over the weekend there was a, a, a shooter, a murder terrorist in Copenhagen uh, and, and one in Vancouver as well. And, and so this, this the, we have to beat the ideology and the idea that um, the Quran says it's okay to kill innocents because it doesn't, and, and, that, and, and in particular, we need to publicize the fact that uh, these radical Islamic extremists are mostly killing Muslims, and, and by, by no means does the Quran say that that's okay. And, and so we have to win this war of ideas. We have to help reform the governments uh, of the Islamic world, which, which tend to be extremely incapable. But, but Islam also needs to reform itself, and, and so um, the entire Arabic world, which is not exactly coincident with the Muslim world, but, but close enough for, for my purposes, uh, some 500 million people publishes fewer books every year than Denmark does with, with 25 million people. Right? No automobiles are produced uh, in the entire uh, Islamic world. Um, the, their attitude, and, and a big part of that is because of their attitude toward women and treatment of women and the, the neglect of that human capital and that human talent. And, and so some changes have to be made inside Islam. There are some we can help politically economically and, and, and through more effective use of information that, that, can, can, that are not going to stop the war, they're not going to end it, but we can turn the aircraft carrier either more rapidly or less rapidly. And I think we should do it more rapidly. Great question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Should we take one over here? Find you? No, it's a cap. It's a, it's yeah, a cap. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butt in. So. Hey, sir, thanks for being here. Good, um, good to be here. I just. Uh, I've heard, there's been some talk in the media, and not as much recently, about a diplomatic solution with the Taliban in Afghanistan. How likely is that? Is it realistic? And is it worth it? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think there is every possibility of a diplomatic solution with the Taliban, as long as we use American military power to reinforce American diplomacy. So if we, if we let the Taliban know that we're not going anywhere, that we, that we are going to ensure stability in Afghanistan, that they cannot retake Kabul, um, uh, that if they try to, we will kill them, they will be much more likely to, to negotiate. Our current stated policy of removing all American troops by the end of 2016 does not give the, t t t right, uh, um, if, if the Taliban does sign a deal under those conditions, they, they will break it. And, and so we've done, I think, a very bad job uh, in this administration of using American military power to enforce and reinforce American diplomacy. 
when you draw red lines, you right, draw red lines carefully. And if you draw red lines, uh, as we did against uh, Syrian use of chemical weapons against its own people, you have to enforce them or your diplomacy suffers. And, and, and so uh, I believe that it is, right, it is possible to come to negotiated solutions. This is how insurgencies end. We negotiated with the Sunnis who had, had you know, literally the blood of my friends on their hands, and, and that was the right thing to do. Um, but but we've, we've, got to, we've got to get, we've got to understand that sometimes military force is part of the solution, and this administration really struggles with that. Back over here. Hero of Armour. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, sir, I was wondering if you could share with us your views of the crisis going on in Ukraine right now, and what, if anything, the United States should be doing about it. Yeah, Joan, uh, Joan I, Harvard professor Joan I is, is really good on this, and, and uh, um, so I'm going to paraphrase him. Um, Russia is dying. Uh, life expectancy for a, a Russian male is 61 and falling. Primary cause of death is alcoholism. Um, a, a, a once great empire that is crumbling, um, single crop economy of oil, and, and the, the biggest thing geopolitically that's happened uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, uh, maybe tied uh, the rise of radical Islam and, and uh, um, fracking and, and the, the change in, in oil prices, cutting oil prices, world oil prices in half, right? Has, has really, really uh, knocked the socks off of Russia. So, so Russia is suffering horribly like any falling, fading power um, it, will, it, will, uh, it will tend to resort to the use of military force and, and to jingoism uh, to try to, to rally public support uh, for its failing policies, and, and that's what's happening. The, the Ukraine um, is, is Ru Russia considers the Ukraine to be its in much, um, Russia reacts to um, Ukrainian moves toward uh, inclusion in the European Union. And, and flirtation with NATO uh, in, in a, a manner similar to the way the U.S. took uh, Soviet nuclear weapons in Cuba, right, uh, too, right, too close to our neighborhood. Um, and, and quite frankly, uh, Moscow cares a whole lot more about the Ukraine than we do. So um, our, I think our current efforts have actually been very, very successful. Uh, the economic sanctions are biting hard. Uh, most importantly, the fall in world oil prices is putting enormous pressure on Putin, uh, there will end up, I think, being um, Russian control of the eastern half of the Ukraine uh, with some degree of influence through all of Ukraine. And, and I actually, um, right, hard as it is to say, think that's okay. Don't think that that is particularly injurious to American national interests. It's a tragedy uh, for the people, in particular the people in, the, in Western Ukraine who consider themselves to be European much more than they do Russian. Um, but they suffer from unfortunate geography. And, and so I, I, I certainly don't think any escalation we do um, in Ukraine, Russia will match and, and multiply. And we do not want to go to war with Russia over the Ukraine. I do believe we should reinforce the, the uh, Eastern NATO members and, and are doing that pretty effectively. So this is actually something that I think the Obama administration has done pretty well. Thank you, sir. So, Ukraine question as well? Yeah. <laughs> Sir. It's so a great question, obviously. We're, right now, the media, especially, and all of us, we're very focused on the Islamic State and the Middle East, but Southeast Asia is also dealing with its own um, bouts of Islamic extremism and insurgencies. What is the likelihood that the Islamic State, re state reaches out to them, um, funnels resources? I just kind of want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, uh, not moving. Uh, uh, quite that far, but the Islamic State is, is, um, has replaced Al-Qaeda as the greatest terror threat in the world. Um, it is expanding. It is opening franchises. Uh, it would certainly like to move into Southeast Asia for, for a number of reasons. It's not clear to me that um, <coughs> radical Islam sells as well in Southeast Asia as it does in the Arabic world. Um, the the um, both, both the Malayan emergency and, and the, the um, insurgencies in Vietnam uh, were largely economic-based. 
Um, and and uh, uh, you know, there's, there's reasons that uh, Indonesia, the world's largest uh, Islamic state, um, has, has, has next to no problems with violent extremism. So I'm uh, on the list of the places I'm worried about, um, uh, Southeast Asia, not as much. Um, Europe, much more. So the, the Islamic po population inside European countries um, is, is uh, I, I, I ha half-jokingly cited stripes and, and, uh, uh, as a model, but, but the American willingness to include people and uh, in particular second generation, uh, uh, se second generation wherever you come from is an American. Um, Europe doesn't do that nearly as well. And so the growing Muslim populations uh, inside European countries are, are where I think the real threat is going to be. So, so you know, that, that's a little bit of good news, right? Yeah. Thanks. Over here, sir. Hello, my name is uh, Joseph Gooden. I'm a political science major, and I hope to become an officer in the U.S. Foreign Service. Oh, God bless you. Um, <laughs> my, uh, my question... Uh, All the disadvantages of being in the military, and you never get to shoot anybody. Yeah, well, <laughs> just so you know, we, uh, you mentioned several times about a better peace, and um, I've had a lot of questions about why that better peace hasn't been able to become established in the Middle East, in Iraq, and in Afghanistan, and and I've heard several times people say that it, it may be because of you know the differences in culture and things like that. However, after World War II, after the Korean War. We were focusing in nations such as Japan and South Korea that have very different cultures to our own, and we've been very successful in establishing better pieces, uh, a better peace in, in those nations. So what is lacking in the Middle East? What is lacking in our policy, and what can we do better to be able to bring about the, that, that better peace in that region? Great, great very well-informed question, and, and, and bless you for wanting to be a foreign service officer. We have. Uh, it's embarrassing the number, the very small number of foreign service officers we have uh, in this nation. Uh, there are more members of military bands than there are foreign service officers. I like a John Philip Sousa march just as much as the next guy, which is to say not at all. But, but <laughs> right, I, I really think we, we need to reallocate some resources and create some more foreign service officers. And, and do read Carter Malkasian's book. He's, he's right, what a foreign service officer is supposed to be. Um, as part of my efforts to upset everybody, uh, let me um, let me let me um, talk about one of the one of the really basic conceptual failings of the George W. Bush administration, uh, which was its its uh, uh, belief in the democratic peace theory. But it had an improper understanding of democratic peace. Right. So, uh, democratic peace theory states that established democracies, liberal democracies, don't go to war with each other, which is broadly speaking true. But democratizing countries are more likely to go to war than are either, either non-democracies, totalitarian states, or liberal democracies. The process of democratization is slow and hard and difficult. And so in the Middle East, where we helped nurture and, and, and uh, uh, gestate uh, democracies in countries very, very different from, from ours and with a very different set of values, very different cultures, different languages, um, much harder task, I think, than, than in, in Germany, Italy. Uh, so J Japan being one of those. Um, we allowed the process to develop over generations. And, and so uh, a democracy is not actually a good thing. Right? All democracy means is mob rule. What we want is liberal democracies, where the majority rules, but the rights of the minority are protected. And for a liberal democracy to exist, there must be institutions to protect the minorities. Those institutions are largely courts and a legal framework. Building that takes a generation or more. And you really don't want to impose democracy until you've got those institutions built. And so what you see, the progress of political development you see in Taiwan, in South Korea, in Japan, was, was really a totalitarian one that, that slowly evolved in democracy. The Bush administration tried to impose democracy immediately without building those institutions, and it, it received mob rule as a result, right? Without any protection for the rights of the minority, and, and the minorities tended to resort then to violence, as they always will. They will take matters into their own hands and protect themselves. The other big mistake we made, well, actually, I actually think Iraq was on its way toward having a better peace, and you can look at the 
look at the metrics, uh, violence was going down, the economy was improving, uh, Sunnis felt more included uh, un until the United States pulled all of its forces out. Because American troops are not just um, guarantors of security, but they also exert a political influence, right? and, and generally a very positive one. And, and so when, when we pulled, literally the day after we pulled all the American troops out of Iraq, the next day, um, Iraqi Prime Minister at the time, Nuri al-Maliki, uh, fired and issued an arrest warrant for his Sunni Vice President. Coincidence? I think not, right? And, and so uh, uh, America with it had exerted political influence toward inclusion of the Sunnis inside the Iraqi political system. When, when, the, 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 when the American troops were gone, the, the, the balance swung wildly out of whack. And so it is my belief that we will send another, um, uh, we will now do what we should have done in 2011. Uh, we, will, we will end up with 10, 15, 20,000 US troops in Iraq. They will be there for generations to come and they will give birth to um, a stable, reasonably democratic uh, Iraq in the Middle East that will be enormously helpful. And I'm, I'm, I remain optimistic over the long term, but it's going to take us a while to get there. Great, well-informed question. Thank you. Sir. You talked about the, uh, the threat of ISIS, and you also said that Pakistan was the most frightening force to you in the world. What's, um, I guess, so frightening about Pakistan that it outweighs ISIS's threat? Yeah, uh, so, so Pakistan uh, has the world's most rapidly growing nuclear stockpile. Um, it, it exceeds or soon will exceed Britain uh, as a nuclear power. Uh, it has perhaps the world's most poorly guarded and secured nuclear stockpile. It is the worst proliferator of nuclear weapons technology in the world, including to Syria and North Korea. Thanks for that. Uh, it is afflicted by a number of radical Islamic uh, insurgencies. It has radical Islamists inside its security forces, including at least to the brigadier general level uh, that I know of, uh, that, that, that I've got documented proof on, uh, but I believe they go much higher than that. Uh, and, and it harbored Osama bin Laden for a decade. Um, and and uh, there is every chance I am much more concerned about radical Islamists taking over the Pakistani government and seizing control of the Pakistani nuclear stockpile, which is at roughly 500 weapons, than I am of Iran developing <coughs> nuclear weapons. Right, I, I think that there is, there is a real chance that that may happen. So um, if, if it weren't for drones, I'm often asked about drones and how I feel about drone warfare. If it weren't for drones and the ability they've given us to dismantle Al-Qaeda Central inside Pakistan's borders with the, the complicity, uh, um, some degree of support of the Pakistani government, uh, we would have probably had to invade Pakistan. That's a country of 300 million people, the size of the United States. Pakistan is a disaster, and it is not going to get better anytime soon. So um, don't, don't, don't keep your eye on Pakistan, and, and one of the reasons I'm so strongly in favor of a long-term American security presence uh, in Afghanistan is because I want to have helicopters and um, uh, uh, men with beards uh, in, in Afghanistan in case they need to secure a, a nuclear weapon site inside Pakistan. Right. That's, a, that's a fun one to contemplate. Thank you, sir. Okay, so I was, I was impacted by the I guess your use of um, the word multi-generational war, and I... It, it already is. Yeah. Right. I, well, I we're, we're, in, we're in generation two now, yeah. Um, but I guess I still am trying to comprehend exactly what is our end state, um, and what are we... I understand that we're trying to change ideology, and we're trying to, um, I guess, eliminate the threat of ISIS to a certain degree at least, but I guess, do we have um, any kind of idea on what, I, I mean, what, what do we want to happen um, mm -hmm. as, like, where do we want to end up by the end of this multi-generational war, war? Yeah, w w we want, um, um, we don't want there to be radical Islamists who want to kill Westerners, or for that matter, kill fellow Muslims. 
uh, in the name of jihad and in the name of creating a caliphate. Um, getting there is going to be extraordinarily difficult, and, and in some ways this fire is going to have to burn itself out. Um, totalitarianism had a good 20-year run in Europe not very long ago, right in the living memory of, of humans. Um, and and uh, radical Islam will similarly, I think, burn itself out. Uh, but I'm afraid it's going to take, I, I, one generation didn't do it, um, and I think it's going to take more. Th there are some, some fairly, um, uh, so a part of the war I can explain to you, I can see pretty clearly. So, so kicking the Islamic State out of Iraq is relatively easy. Um, it, it's going to take, we've got 3,000 boots on the ground right now. Uh, it, it's going to take four or five times that, some 15,000 American advisors. Marty Dempsey, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, keeps saying it's going to take American advisors embedded inside these Iraqi and Kurdish units to, to, to winkle these guys out of Mosul, the second largest city in Iraq, right? Uh, they're not going to be able to do it without us, and, and that means some people who, are, who dress like trees um, are, are going to get killed, right? And, and Dempsey keeps saying that, and the White House keeps saying what, Mar what General Dempsey meant to say was, and then Dempsey comes out and says it again. And, and ultimately, that's going to happen, right? I, I, I genuinely believe that uh, by the end of this president's term, um, the Islamic State will no longer. It may be it may be fighting a phase two insurgency, but it will not have it will not hold territory inside Iraq. Syria is another question entirely. Right? We don't know who we want to win in Syria, right? So Assad is a really bad guy. He uses chemical weapons against his own people. He's bad. The Islamic State is worse. There was a third option in Syria. There were the, the so-called Free Syrian Army, a group of moderate Syrian, Syrian rebels uh, who, who, in the summer of 12, uh, Petraeus and Clinton and Panetta and Gates all said we should arm, train, and equip. We made a different decision. Those are guys are all dead now. So there are two options left in Syria, ISIS and Assad. The third option is we fight both of them and occupy Syria for a generation with 150,000 or 200,000 troops. Anybody voting for that one? Okay, then the least bad option is Assad. But I don't think this administration can get there, right, having drawn a red line in the sand against him. Although de facto they are supporting Assad right now. We are conducting airstrikes in Syria today in support of Assad's forces, fighting against ISIS, and we are not bombing any of Assad's forces. We just can't, right, can't stomach saying that out loud. So, but, but we've got to reverse the momentum of, of ISIS. We've got to, we've got to defeat this narrative, and, and so we need to get serious about pushing them out of Iraq. Then I'm, then, and I think that's going to be the business of this administration. I think the next administration uh, will come out more fully in support of Assad, and we'll, we'll defeat ISIS in Syria. Unfortunately, by then, I think it will have metastasized, and it will be strong in other places. In Libya, where we also failed to build a better peace, cleverly, right? And, and so this, we're going we're gonna to keep whacking this mole, um, and, and, and with, with some degree of success, we can achieve our primary national security objective. So for the last 15 years, the essence of American strategy against radical Islamic extremism has been never again give them a home base uh, in which to plan, uh, from which to prepare, and from which to conduct operations against the United States and our allies. Right. We were doing a somewhat reasonable job on that until we ceded them Iraq and Syria. They now have that base, and they're using it very effectively. We need to take that base away from them and not give them any further bases, and we need to fight them on the internets. Right. That's, that's what we need to do. We, have no, we are not. It's infuriating. The president correctly says we need to defeat and ultimately destroy ISIS, but he is not willing to put his money where his mouth is and provide the resources required to do that. And um, I, I don't think that's going to happen in this administration. I'm very hopeful it will in the next. Thank you, sir. We uh, only have the room for the book signing until 6 o'clock, so if we could take those of you who are standing and make the questions quick. Uh, and make the answers quick, too. Make the answers quick. Then, yeah, good luck with that. Sir. So the possibility of America's relations with Iran improving has been the subject of an ongoing political debate and drama. 
Um, how optimistically, if at all, do you view this possibility? And then what potential outcomes um, could we see as a result of that in the region um, and considering the wider fight against Islamic extremism as a whole? Yeah, great, great question. So, so uh, Iran is a very different place. Iran is not an Arab country. It's a Persian country. Um, and I am strongly optimistic long term on, on the Persian civilization and on American relations with Iran. Um, I, I think that um, there's the possibility for a breakthrough here. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, I talked about democracy. Democracy in Saudi Arabia would be a disaster. Right? So, so Saudi Arabia, the primary funder of ISIS, the primary funder of Al-Qaeda, 15 of the 19 September 11th hijackers were Saudis. Right? We don't want uh, Saudi Arabia, which is currently the pillar of American policy in the Middle East, uh, to, be, to, to vote. We do want the Iranian people to vote. They, they do not harbor uh, radical Islamic extremism. They do have a uh, government uh, that has ideas that are antithetical to us. But as we know very well in this country, uh, governments change. Right? And, and so I'm, I'm hopeful long term on Iran. Um, I, I understand uh, the concerns about the, the rhetoric uh, of this government. I, I believe, and this is what, one of the big reasons why I didn't support the invasion of Iraq in March 2003, Although I believe that Saddam had WMD, I believe that states can be deterred. Right? So we deterred the Soviet Union, uh, despite the fact that it had both uh, a stated policy of destroying us and uh, the means to do so. We deterred the Soviet Union successfully for 60 years. Right? There is no reason we could not have deterred Iraq, right? and we cannot deter Iran, even if it acquires weapons, which I don't want it to do. And I do believe that we can we can come up with an agreement that will make that less likely. So a little bit of optimism. Thank you. Sir. Uh, I just uh, I wondered. Um, you talked about a little bit about you know the happenings in Vancouver and Copenhagen and uh, France. Uh, we've been really focused on outside of the U.S. Do you think there's any um, hint to insurgency within the U.S. I mean, ISIS just uh, within the last month issued a, a threat to Obama, so they, they, you know, they cut his head off in the White House. Uh, how seriously do you think we should take that? Uh, so given the Secret Service's ability uh, to protect the president <laughs> recently, the president may want to start packing heat. Um, we, we've, got, we've got to do better, right? We've got to do better. You've got to protect the president of the United States more effectively than we have. Um, so the, the, the threat is real. Um, there have been Americans who, who have joined ISIS. Um, there have been uh, girls from Colorado right, who, who bought plane tickets to Turkey to join ISIS, uh, who wanted to sign up for the, the, right, the, the female wing of the Islamic State, which does not offer really particularly a good deal, um, and, but, but talks to how powerful this ideology is and how dangerous disaffected youth are. So I am, um, I, I, I don't, and, and um, uh, uh, we, we had a, a, a Canadian Muslim um, radicalized over the internet uh, who attacked the Canadian parliament. Canadians, right, Canadians and the people of BYU are the nicest people on the planet. If, if, you, can, if, if you can get a Canadian fired up enough to, 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 to go kill innocent people, You've got a powerful message. So I don't discount the message at all, the power or the, or the risk that something will happen here inside the United States. It's why I believe we should be taking um, the, the, it's what, why we should be fighting far more effectively, uh, put four more resources into the fight against ISIS on the ground in Iraq than we currently have, I'm talking a factor of five to 10, right, which, which wouldn't strain us. We've, we've got the resources to do that. We just haven't made the political decision to do that. We need to defeat this narrative. We need ISIS and, and prospective ISIS supporters to know that if you join this organization, we will kill you. And, and that's, we, we are not, that message is not yet clear because it's not yet true. So to protect, and, and at some point we'll get there. I would just prefer to do that before a whole lot of Americans get killed. So yeah. other than that, ask a cheery question, Major, please, for God's sake. <laughs> Um, thank you for coming here. I've enjoyed your talk. Um, 
So you've talked at great length about the size that's rapidly growing, that there could potentially be finding a home, and they can uh, weaponize Canadians, the whole nine yards. Contrast that's a phrase that has never been said before. <laughs> Uh, contrasting that with uh, the American military, which at the same time is shrinking, um, we've gone through sequester. Do you think there's going to become a tipping point that is they're too far ahead and we're too far behind? Um, right. They, they will never defeat us. Um, the, the, the greatest threat to the security of the United States, I've talked about Pakistan. Pakistan is the most dangerous state in the world to us. Uh, the most dangerous threat to the, to the United States uh, is the inability of our political system to work. And um, th this, this country, its young people uh, in particular, can do anything, right? And, and so um, it's a great, great place to end. So, so when, when we created the all-volunteer force at the end of the Vietnam War in 1973, nobody predicted it would survive one protracted war, much less two. But 15 years into this thing, the American military is stronger than it was on September 11th. Uh, we have. We are turning away kids who want to join. Worse than that, we are giving pink slips to captains serving in combat in Afghanistan mm -hmm. as we downsize our military in a time of war. And, 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 and an appalling way to treat uh, people who have assumed unli unlimited liability, um, an appalling uh, state of affairs for the greatest power on earth, and a decision uh, that, that the Army rightly was criticized for, but the poor Army didn't have many options for what to do given the aforementioned sequester. Right? A, 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 and, and with sequester, Congress essentially held a gun to its head and said, we dare you to pull the trigger, we dare you, and then they pulled the trigger. And, and the, um, the, the sequester was, was an attempt to uh, get a handle on a uh, growing deficit, which was viewed as a, a greater threat to uh, to American well-being than uh, the Islamic State or than cutting the American military and uh, the deficit is, is dissolving quite frankly it's, it's helped by by the fall in oil prices uh, the, the rebounding of the American economy the stock market at record levels the, the country is doing very very well economically the Congress of the United States and the President of the United States are not doing very well they are unable to agree on the most basic functions of government, taxing the American people to provide the goods the American people need, the most important of which is security, and, and one of the most important tools of that, uh, I talked about the Foreign Service as, as one of those uh, grossly underfunded, uh, un unable to fund the, the war on the internets that we should be fighting, the information war we should be fighting, that's State Department responsibility. They don't have the resources to do it. But we also don't have the resources we need to build the military we need, given the world we're in. And this is a failure of presidential leadership. It's a failure of congressional leadership. The good news is there is finally, I think, an incentive to solve it. So the Republicans have both houses of Congress. They desperately want to demonstrate that they can be trusted to run the country, government shutdowns, Government shutdowns do not demonstrate that you're able to run the country. We need the government to operate. The government of the United States does incredibly important work every day. It needs to stay open. Uh, so the Republicans have an opportunity to, to uh, demonstrate that they can be trusted running the country. They have a great presidential candidate coming in Jeb Bush. Uh, he has what I think is going to be a great vice presidential candidate in Condi Rice. They need some wins. Uh, and they've got the great chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, John McCain, uh, who desperately wants this to happen. And, and so I am hopeful that we are going to see a reversal of the sequester and a commitment of the resources we need to keep the American people safe, to keep the American military strong. Let me close, if I can, uh, by thanking the young people in the room wearing the colors, uh, the cloth of our nation uh, when, when um, Lieutenant Colonel Mofu and, and Colonel Kucharik, close, close enough, right? Lots of, lots of consonants there. And, 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 and uh, right, re retired old man, Lieutenant Colonel Noggle signed up and uh, uh, the, 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 the follically challenged Colonel and I, our, our exact contemporaries, right, both signed up in, in 1984. And let me tell you, when we signed up in 1984, we didn't think we were gonna go to war, right? 
the, 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 we were 10 years after Vietnam. Nobody thought the Cold War was going to go hot. Uh, we were sign I was, uh, I won't dis discredit you, but I was signing up because I was the oldest of six and I could get a free education at West Point. Right? The kids who signed up today, the cadets in the room, right, signed up knowing that they were going to go to war, signed up when their nation was at war, and volunteered to serve. And let me tell you, I'd like to say that if I were you, I'd make the same choice, but I can't prove that. What I do know is I have enormous respect for your generation of young people, your commitment to service, your desire to keep this country safe and free. And, and every day I am grateful that you're out there um, volunteering to, to man the barricades uh, while I'm fat, dumb, and happy in Pennsylvania um, and, and getting the chance to, to visit our colleges and uh, our campuses and, and be frankly inspired about the great things ahead for this country. So thank you all very much. And